Well, government has misled the public by stating that only 35% of the annual budget is spent on wages. The true figure is 88%, and that's according to the fourth quarter labor market navigator report. And joining us for more on this is Peter Ayling. He's an analyst at Profit Analytics. Thanks so much, Peter, for joining us this afternoon. Of course, I've just highlighted there one of uh, you know the startling uh, outcomes of uh, a report like this. So for you overall, uh, what has been the, the main just stand out and the take home? I think it's a bit of a double-edged sword. I think firstly we're very surprised at how much the income inequality gap has been closed over the last 10 years. I think that's really encouraging news. I think uh, what's not encouraging is that a large part of it has been, has been attained through managerial bloat in government and increasing in, in sort of government personnel and salaries, which is not necessarily the most productive uh, utilization of taxpayers' money. Uh, as you mentioned, we said that it's not 35% of government payroll that goes towards wages and salaries, it's actually 88%. Uh, the 35% is a measure of total government expenditure, which includes payments to all external providers where external providers have their own workforces. If you rather use government final expenditure, which is a better measure of the value added by government alone, you find that it's actually 88 and not, not 35%. It's a startling uh, set of numbers, uh, I, I must say, uh, Peter. One in five of South African workers are now employed by the government. The first word that comes to mind is bloated. And after bloated comes inefficient, because as soon as you're always guaranteed a job and guaranteed a salary increase without increasing your productivity, then people become lazy and, yeah, again, bloated, as I've said. Also, it sort of suggests to me that perhaps the dreadful unemployment statistics of, of South Africa, which I think is officially 25.2% uh, unemployment rate, is being artificially uh, massaged to the upside. And with, without a bloated government sector, it would be far, far worse. I 100% agree. I think it, it would be dramatically worse. A, a lot of employment has been created by government because the reality is if you consider the poor education systems, the highly restrictive labour regulations, they're pretty much the only sector that's been dramatically increasing employment. They currently employ 2.83 million people, which means that one in five South African workers currently work for government. Um, and then in addition to that, the government have increased wages and salaries well beyond the 5.4 per cent that, that form part of the sectoral determinations um, for public sector workers through job regrading and, and promotions rather than through wage increases. Yeah. And yet uh, it's in this context that we recently had uh, President Jacob Zuma uh, along with uh, the Development Minister uh, Ibrahim, uh, Ibrahim Patel calling for a salary freeze on high income earners. I mean, that uh, quite startling that, uh, you know, that kind of commentary is coming through. Of course, it's uh, been criticized by a large mem uh, a large portion of, uh, uh, you know, corporate governance experts out there simply because it will tell of the kind of skills uh, flight that we could possibly see. How, how do you read that story and that what's playing out there? The, the reality is incomes have been increasing dramatically over the last 10 years, on, on average well beyond inflation for employed workers. And I think it's important to separate out the unemployment problem that mm -hmm. the country faces and the, the change in income inequality amongst employed workers. So when we say that the average black income in 2001 was 15% of the average white income and it's currently 40%, we can be happy that we've made great strides to reducing income inequality. The unemployment problem is a completely different scenario and the reality is for someone who doesn't have a job, uh, th they are a burden in the form that they'd have to draw welfare or that they can't generate an income for, for themselves. Peter, the um, income inequality you've just spoken about, and again, I'm just I'm reading this about the third time I've read it now, and every time I read it, I just, my eyes just pop out of my head. It says, income inequality between the races, especially between black people and white people, has declined sharply, as you say. The average black person earned 40% of a typical white person's income compared to the 2000 figure. Are you saying, again, because of the government involvement in the South African employment uh, scenario, that the inequality, again, is being massaged artificially rather than market forces um, making it uh, equalize itself over a number of years rather than in the short term we're talking about now? Definitely. Um, I mean, 40 percent of the highest earning blacks in South Africa, defined as the percentage that earn more than an average white income, are employed by government. That's two out of every five individuals. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that the private sector is not making dramatic strides. The, the remaining 60% or three out of five are employed in the private sector and have seen 
dramatic increases in incomes. Over the last 10 years, as I said, black incomes have increased on average by 14.9% per annum, while white incomes have only increased by 5.3% per annum. At that current rate of income growth, we could expect no income inequality within the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, the scary part of that is you're 100% correct. Some of it has been has been driven through increased employment in government, through job regrading, through promotions that maybe aren't warranted in terms of output and effectiveness. We currently see roughly 20% of the South African workforce employed by government. If we expect to generate that type of employment going forward and that type of income growth going forward, what are we looking at? A government that employs 40% of the workforce. We've seen in the European case how difficult it is for economies like Greece and Italy to maintain their economic standing when 40% or greater of their workforce is actually employed in government. What's impeding private sector's ability to actually see that same kind of growth that the public sector seems to be seeing? These, these are the usual culprits. Uh, predominantly, it's, it's a lack of, of good education from, from public education. And this is, this is perpetuating the cycle of income inequality. High income earners who can afford private education make sure that their children are highly educated and can continue to be high income earners because skills in South Africa are so highly in demand. Low income earners who are subject to the public education system often get an inferior education and as a result are, you know, maintained in that level of low income. So if we fix the education system, that, that rate of reduction in income disparity could actually be much greater than it currently is. What does that is. say about what, what's good enough for the public sector not being good enough for the private sector? Well, I, I've made this point many times. The, the private sector is driven predominantly by profitability, and you can, you can argue against that, but that's the reality. Um, so they need to make sure that every person they employ has a high return on investment in that company and you know, is, is profitable to employ. That's already impeded by stringent labor regulations, so companies are unwilling to employ untested people. And then in addition to that, they, you know, if they're going to employ someone who's untested, better that person have a high level of education so that they can increase the probability that that person is a productive resource. Uh, the government, which is not driven by profitability, there's a, there's a primary disconnect between the profitability of government, which is driven by tax revenue, which is really driven yeah. by the profitability in the private sector, and, and the expenditure in government, which is, is driven, as I said, by change in job, job gradings, um, promotions, and obviously wage increases. Peter, we, we were chatting to a chap from, um, or a couple of people about the Mexican economy yesterday. We were sort of looking at other emerging market economies and comparing them to South Africa. We spoke to the Mexican ambassador to South Africa. We spoke to an expert from Gibbs about the Mexican economy and things that we could and, and, and maybe shouldn't learn uh, from that e economy. But when you go back to that uh, figure that we spoke about at the beginning of the interview, the true figure is 88%, i.e. Uh, the annual budget uh, being spent on wages. Without being too specific, um, contextualise that. What would, say, for example, the Mexican government's annual uh, budget be on, on wages as a percentage? I, I must Roughly be honest, I haven't, I haven't looked at that. And, and I think you'd find it varies from economy to economy. It's directly related to the proportion of, of the population that's employed in government and, and the value that's generated by government, purely by government, not through external providers. So. We're currently sitting at 88%. It's, it's maybe not desirable, but it's definitely sustainable because it's not over 100%. But you know, if it approaches that 100% or greater, then basically you're spending more money on salaries than the value that's actually being delivered by your government.